Good day. I'm Cliff Kuhn of Georgia State University, and today on our program on Atlanta history, we have a very distinguished guest with us, uh, Senator Leroy Johnson, who in 1962 was elected the first black state senator from Georgia since the days of Reconstruction. Uh, senator Johnson had a long and varied, has had a long and varied career, uh, has been an attorney in Atlanta since the late 50s, been involved in politics, was the candidate for mayor, and in 1970 and 71 was involved in the return of Muhammad Ali, uh, Muhammad Ali's first prize fight uh, in over three years. Uh, Senator Johnson, it's a pleasure to have you today. Are you a native Atlantan? Yes, I am. And let me say it's a real pleasure to be here on this okay. program. Yes, I am. I am one of the few that was that is, that is indigenous to to Atlanta. I was born and raised here. Uh, I was born really. I was. I lived on Mason Turner, but I was born in Grady Hospital. So uh, I have um, seen a tremendous amount of progress take place in our city. I gather you are a graduate of uh, Washington High School. That's right. Washington High School and then, of course, to Morehouse College. Tell us but, a little bit about first about Washington High. Well, at that time, when I was at Washington High, it was the only high school for blacks uh, in Atlanta. And, of course, uh, in my homeroom class, there were some 45 or 50 people, uh, students. Uh, there were portables at Washington High at that time. Uh, Professor uh, Harper was the was the principal. C. L. Harper. C. L. Harper, and uh, Washington High was the place where you had to get your education if you got one at all for black people. Uh, but uh, subsequent, of course, to that, uh, and after having finished that, I went to Morehouse. What do you recall about Mr. Harper? Because he's one of those leaders who was a giant mm -hmm. at the time, but who people have forgotten today. That's right, and that's really unfortunate because. C.L. Harper was the type of person that, that had one burning desire, and that desire was to see black youth, male and female, get an education. And that was his whole life, and that's what he fought for. He was also president of the NAACP, a very courageous fellow, and uh, he got in trouble with the Atlanta Board of Education because of his position and because of his stand and because he was forthright. That was over the issue of equalization of salaries. That's right. That. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Did you recall any about anything about that effort uh, to equalize black and white teacher salaries? Or you were a high school student at that time. I don't imagine you knew too That's much right, that. except for the fact that he led that fight. And as a result of that, uh, he was ostracized to a great extent uh, by the board itself. And uh, he had many problems because he spoke out and, and, and insisted that black teachers ought to have the same pay as, as white teachers. Mm -hmm. But um, at Washington High, though there were a lot of students there, and, and um, the teachers were, and I can remember as if it was yesterday, I had a teacher by the name of Susie Cunningham, my homeroom teacher, but insisted that you had a you must learn that education was extremely important and and i think that but for that kind of insistence by black teachers it would have been extremely difficult to survive in a segregated society mm -hmm. what uh, washington high is only of course one of numerous black community institutions at that time and mr harper was only one of numerous black community leaders at that time what other organizations or institutions do you recall from the 40s or leaders from the 40s well you had the YMCA you had the Butler Street YMCA and that was uh, extremely important institution in terms of motivation and of course we had the black churches uh, and I don't believe that black people could have survived uh, during that period of time without the black churches. Uh, it was there that you got your strength. It was at the black churches that you could say anything you wanted to, or you couldn't say, uh, say it uh, in any other place. Uh, but the institution of the black churches and the Butler Street YMCA um, uh, were two of the organizations that, you know, black people uh, look catered to. You belong to Ebenezer Church, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, and I do. What do you recall about Martin Luther King Sr. Uh, from the pulpit or in the church? Well, 
he was one of those great pioneers. Uh, Dr. King, uh, Dr. Borders, uh, William Home Borders, um, uh, preachers of, of that, uh, of, of that uh, statute uh, were outstanding during those days. And the interesting thing about it is that take Daddy King, and we call him Daddy King, we do that uh, affectionately, uh, but he had a way of saying uh, that there's nothing you can't do uh, if you set your mind to it. And uh, he was a very powerful and influential uh, person. And he influenced those of us who thought that perhaps one day that we could make a contribution. And it came from fellows like Daddy King. Dr. Borders was a tremendous fellow, great speaker. Mm -hmm. Now we'll forget that he was the one that I first heard to use the phrase, I am somebody. Subsequently, of course, Jesse, Jesse Jackson uh, um, popularized it. But it was Borders' poem, I am somebody that stirred the black community and stirred black youth. Uh, and uh, he was quite a, quite a person. What are some of your earliest memories of segregation and Jim Crow, personally? Well, let me tell you, living in a segregated society, there is a tendency to accept it because you, know it, you, know, you do not know anything else. I went to Morehouse. And um, I never will forget, as long as I live, that Dr. Mays said to us, and Dr. Mays used to speak to the student body every Tuesday. This is Benjamin Mays. Benjamin E. Mays, President, Mays, President of Morehouse, and then subsequently President of Atlanta Board of Education. But he was a moving force at Morehouse. And he said to us, and I used to go to the Fox Theater. The Fox Theater was segregated. You had to pay your money and go up. 100,000 steps, it appeared, but go up at these steps in the back and sit in what they call the buzzard roof mm -hmm. in order to see the picture. And, and I did that uh, as a part of a segregated pattern. One day at chapel, Dr. May said to us that Mohas men cannot afford to pay for segregation. Mohas men cannot go to segregated theaters and he talked about the fact that, that we, those of us who were there within the sound of his voice, he said, get yourselves an ideal and cling to it and cleave to it and worship it as though it was Almighty God. For in order to survive in a segregated society, you must be ironclad and steel girded. It was that ironclad and steel girded philosophy, I think, certainly inspired me. And from that day on, I never again went to the Fox Theater, never again went to a segregated theater. So segregation was real to me because I lived in it, was a part of it. And I've seen a tremendous amount of change take place since that time. What about Morehouse of 40-something years ago? Uh, what was what was it like? You've given us some examples, but well, what was it like to be a Morehouse man at that time? I don't know that there's anything as comparable being a Morehouse man. I know that the best schools in the country, Harvard, Yale, Morehouse, Princeton, and others, but, but being there was made a difference. It made a difference because every day we had chapel, and every day before us would appear a black leader. Um, and he would come and talk about what we must do to make a difference in the world. And so we could sit there and see the president of Howard University, uh, the president of uh, other black institutions, uh, black um, uh, uh, religious leaders, you know, all would come to Morehouse and all would be a part of a chapel program at one particular time or the other. But they would give and would provide for us the kind of diet by which uh, we knew that we could not be a part of segregation, that Mohawk men had to make a difference, uh, that we had to do something with our lives that was meaningful. And I think that that's the reason you talk about the Mohawk mystique. I think mm -hmm. that's what it is. It is a feeling that if you're a Mohawk man, you can't be ordinary. You got to be extraordinary. You got to do something different. You got to make a difference. And, and you learn that there. And I'm not so sure you can get it at other places. You know, but that was the unique thing about Morehouse. 
and that was that feeling that um, that you had to make a contribution and you had to make a difference. How did you decide to get involved in public life or politics yourself? Because I noticed that by the late 40s, by the time you're still a college student, you're involved in such organizations as the Atlanta Negro Voters League, for example. And I was just curious about how you got involved in things, what kinds of things did you first get involved with um, in the public realm? I had some good teachers at Morehouse. Uh, Dr. Brisbane was my political science teacher. He had a mock election on the campus. Uh, the Progressive Party, the Democratic Party, the Republican Party. I got involved in politics on the campus uh, and headed the Progressive Party and we won the election at Morehouse and that kind of stemmed over into the community. Um, my involvement with the Atlanta Negro Voters League was, I think, one of the turning points of my life. Uh, Dr. Um, Mr. Walden, A.T. Walden, who was uh, the black lawyer at that time that uh, all of us looked up to, but he was head of the uh, Democratic Party, and I was, a I was a Democrat then, and of course I'm a Democrat now. But A.T. Walden, uh, Warren Cochran, yeah, director, uh, of Public direct, director of Public Street Y, um, uh, Mr. C.R. Yates, who was head of Yates and Milton, uh, D Mr. Dobbs, uh, John, John Wesley Dobbs. Dobbs, who was a Republican and um, uh, head of the Ma Masonic organization, and I'm a 33rd degree Mason. Uh, and, but they were the ones that at that time set the political tone for black folks in Atlanta. Uh, the Atlanta Negro Voters League, uh, John Calhoun, mm -hmm. who was also a, a tremendous force in the Voters League, but it was a bipartisan organization of Democrats and Republicans. They came together, they looked at candidates, they assessed the records of candidates, and then they made a recommendation to the black community. And 90% of the black people followed the recommendation of the Voters League in the ticket that they would put out every year. Well, I became involved in that process. Dr. C.A. Baycoat, who was professor of history at Atlanta University and uh, head of the history department there, was a tremendous um, force in the Atlanta Negro Voters League. And they formed a college to teach people how to use the voting machine. And I headed that, um, that subcommittee for the Voters League. What would go on at these classes? Well, we would go into the community, and at that time you had a voting machine, and you, and you had to do certain things with that machine and pull the level in, in, in order to vote. We then went into the community and taught people how to use that voting machine, and we did it throughout Atlanta. At that time, and there was a meeting between Hartsville and the leadership of the black community, and that leadership was made up of Dr. King Sr., uh, Dr. Borders, uh, Attorney Walden, uh, Cochran, um, Yates, mm -hmm. uh, just a, uh, Calhoun, just a whole, whole group. Uh, they met with Hartsville about um, some issue. It might have been black policemen or something else, uh, or put it on black policemen. But in that meeting, Hartsville said to them, in, in the essence, that, you know, that's, I understand what you're saying, but you really don't elect me. You don't have any voters on the voting list. You know, you get 5,000 voters and you come back to see me. Baycoat headed the Negro Voters League registration drive. And I worked very closely with this him. Is the All Citizens Registration Committee. Uh, All Citizens Registration Committee. Dr. Baycoat headed that, and I was one of a person that worked very closely with him. And from that thrust, uh, got this insensible urge and desire to 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 get into politics. Uh, what would you all do in the registration committee? Uh, what well, kinds of things would you go do? We would do two things. Number one, we would send out notices and we would have a meeting, say, in Collier Heights, in a particular community. And we would try to fill a church there. And we would pass out some little cards indicating how to vote on the voting machine, how to use the voting machine, the, ne the need and necessity for so doing, and why we had to do it. And then we would get the voting machine itself, and then we would demonstrate it. What is so significant is that we would have someone from the audience to come up and to demonstrate the use of the voting machine. And it is so easy to make mistakes. 
you know. And uh, we let them make whatever mistakes they had to make. We would go back over it. But we did that repeatedly. The result being is that we did, in fact, get the 5,000 votes. Uh, we did put them on the, on the list and uh, was able to, as a result of that, affect the election of, of mayors in the city. Do you remember when the first uh, black policeman came on the force in 48? Yes, I do. And um, at that time, um, it was, it was a, of course, a step forward in Atlanta's history. Uh, but the Butler Street YMCA, again, it became uh, the living source for, for the black community. So many things have emanated from the Butler Street Y in terms of its usefulness and its, and its being so helpful in the development of black people in Atlanta. It was at the Butler Street Y that housed the first black police officers. Mm -hmm. uh, the thought was that it was not the time to house, house them in the police station downtown. All on the same. All on the same, you know, in the same building mm -hmm. and, and that sort of thing. So in order to be effective, uh, they thought it, the best thing to do was to house them off away from the police department. So it was the Butler Street Y that provided the, the place for the first police officers. The first police officers could not uh, arrest white people, and we had to evolve to that point. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the, the pride that uh, black folks took when the first black police officers was sworn in and uh, moved from the headquarters, which was the Butler Street Y, mm -hmm. was just tremendous. But that came because the black leadership in Atlanta did, in fact, uh, flex their muscles in the sense that they were able to get black people registered so that they could make a difference at the, um, at the, at the polls mm -hmm. and, and provide that difference for a man who would do what Hartsfield did. After graduating from Morehouse, I gather, you got a master's from Atlanta University yes. and then taught in the public schools here for four years. Uh, where did you teach? At Booker T. Washington High, at the school that I, there. right, the school that I finished. Yeah. And were you there at the time of the Brown versus Board decision? And I was wondering sort of what impact, immediate impact that had uh, in either the black community or in Atlanta as a whole. I was not at Washington High at that time. Um, I finished Atlanta University, and my professor there was a fellow by the name of William Boyd. He was the state president of the NEACP, mm -hmm. but had a very definite influence on my own life. He uh, taught political science, and I finished, got my degree in political science, decided to go to law school. Um, and I think that's where I was, I believe, when that okay. decision came down. Okay. He went to law school at North Carolina Central and then came back to Atlanta and I believe you have a story about your employment upon coming back to Atlanta. Yes, um, I finished law school in 54 and came back to Atlanta. My wife was a librarian at the VA hospital in Tuskegee mm -hmm. and so I was uh, there in Tuskegee and, and had been offered an opportunity to set up my practice in Tuskegee. There was not a black lawyer in Tuskegee or within a radius of, uh, to Montgomery, as a matter of fact. Uh, so the opportunity was uh, really, uh, I, at that time, I thought was a, a golden opportunity. The community people had come together and said they would provide me with an office and, and uh, uh, for a period of time, free rent, you know, and that sort of thing. Uh, Colonel Walden called me, A.T. Walden called me and says he wanted to speak with me about the um, situation in Atlanta. So I came back to Atlanta and sat down and talked to Walden. Now, Colonel Walden always, and I call him Colonel because we did that very affectionately, but he was a very great influence uh, on my life. Uh, I had worked closely with him in the Voters League uh, before going to law school. It was part of the reason I went to law school because of, of Colonel Walden. And so when I finished law school and came back, he called and said to me, he says, you know, we supported Paul Webb in his election. Now, Paul Ford, Webb was solicitor then general. Was the solicitor general. Now that office is called the district attorney uh, office. But he was the solicitor general. And he had ran against, um, I believe, either Daniel Duke or it might have been Reuben Garland, mm -hmm. but one of them. Uh, Walden had put his great weight and support behind... Um, 
Mr. Webb, and Mr. Webb said to him that if he was elected, he would then appoint him black to his staff. And Walden asked me if I would accept that, that job. And I thought about it, thought about going to Tuskegee, uh, setting up my own practice, and then thought that it probably would be a good thing to stay in Atlanta. And I agreed to accept the job and became the first black to serve in the district attorney's office, then the solicitor general's office, um, um, ever. And that's how I started uh, in the district attorney, in the solicitor's office. Well, what was that like, uh, breaking that, blazing that trail, as it were? It was interesting because uh, I was a criminal investigator in his office, and there was a big room where all the investigators had a desk. And when I was appointed and then uh, went to work for the first day, I walked into the office where all the other investigators were, were seated at that desk and determined that I had a special office. I had a private office. And I looked over here and they said, uh, here's your office, Leroy Johnson. I went in there and it was a great big office, you know. And so there were 10 or 12 white investigators out there all jammed up in front of, on a desk. And I had, <laughs> and I had this big office, you know, uh, uh, by myself. Of course, they did not, uh, that was not the reason it was given to them. The reason, of course, of that uh, I was black and of course they weren't quite ready for that. But the result being is that I had a better facility than they had sitting out there at that little desk. And uh, that was very interesting. It was the first time that a black had uh, worked as a, uh, a professional in the Fulton County Courthouse. And, uh, and of course, I worked there uh, in the solicitor's office for about five or six years. What was the reception you got either from um, your colleagues, judges, clients, whomever? It was a standoffish office type of uh, reception. Um, uh, the fellows in the office itself had to, uh, were very cool, uh, with the exception of two or three. There was a gentleman there who was an investigator named Louis Clyburn very nice guy uh, you always find that but uh, but most of them had to first get to know me they did not all they could see was the fact that, that I had a different uh, uh, skin complexion than theirs I was black and they was white and therefore nothing could uh, nothing could come of that that was good and so they were kind of very standoffish for, to begin with uh, in the courthouse itself um, there was a feeling that um, uh, I, I, I felt very strongly about the fact that that um, there was a a what do you call a long arms length type of relationship, mm -hmm. you know, for a period of time, and I guess maybe for about six or seven months before things began to thaw out. But on on a whole, most of the judges were except were cordial. Uh, I've developed some very good friends there. Um, and these, the friendship that I developed then uh, is still persists. Uh, some of the judges are still there. Um, I'm trying to think particularly, well, a, a number of them are still there, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, in 1962, you made a successful race for the Georgia State Senate, becoming the first uh, black state senator since Reconstruction. Maybe you could talk about how you arrived at that decision, what were the circumstances, and something about that race itself. You know, the interesting thing about it is that I was a part of the Atlanta Negro Voters League at that time, and in 1962, if you recall, there was the county unit system in existence. I prior think to that today, time. people have no idea what the county unit uh, system is, and they think it's ancient history, so <laughs> maybe you could go in and tell a little bit about what the county right. unit system was. Well, it was a system by which the rural counties had a greater voice than the urban counties. For instance, a county in Georgia that might have had um, 10,000 people. Lanier County. Lanier County, you know, had, say, two unit votes or three unit votes, whatever the case may be, but at Fulton County with hundreds of thousands of people had one or, you know, less than the, than the rural county. The inequitable part of the, the county unit system was that the rural county dominated the urban counties. So if you had these mm -hmm. unit votes, then the weight of a voter in, say, Lanier County or oh. Nichols County would be many, many, many times as, as 
valuable, really, as uh, the it's vote of somebody in Fulton County. Somebody in Fulton County. County. And, and in 1962, the Supreme Court decided the county unit case in Tennessee first, and then Georgia, Baker versus Carr, mm -hmm. in ending the, the, county unit the county unit system, and I guess also calling for reapportionment of the legislature as, legislature as well, so that That's the right. same kind of arrangement wouldn't exist in the state house. And I believe Westbury brought the suit here. James Westbury. James Westbury, who later was a member of the Senate and became my very best friend, one of my best friends. Okay. But uh, the court, the United States Supreme Court, declared the county unit system in Georgia unconstitutional. Now, before then, uh, there were one senator from Fulton County in the Georgia Senate. It used to be Everett Milliken for a long time. That's right. right. And after that, there was, I believe, five senators okay. from Fulton County. So it expanded from one state senator to five, to five from Fulton County. And I ran for one of those seats and, uh, and was elected. At that time, the relationship in the black community politically was one in which the Voters League had a tremendous amount of, 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 um, of authority. Mm -hmm. uh, so I went to the Voters League and asked for their support. And uh, I went with a program and a plan. I first had an organization. And there was others who also sought the support of the Voters League. Yeah. And so the Voters League uh, uh, voted to endorse me, to support me. You, of course, do not do that now. You make your decision to run, and then you run. But we then went to the voters leg and says, you know, I want to run for this office, and here are my credentials, and this is why I, you ought to support me, and I can win based on these factors. And right. they did support right. me. And I ran for that office uh, and was elected. The significant thing is that that was a countywide election. And so I came in. And along with the gentleman by the name of Ray Geary, I had the largest number of votes. He had the second largest mm -hmm. number of votes, but it would require runoff. A gentleman went to the court and contested that fact that the votes was counted on a countywide basis rather than on a district basis. Right. The interesting thing is that Judge Pye, who was a very conservative judge, Durwood Pye, Durwood Pye uh, heard the case. And there were those of us who thought, oh, it's just no way that he's going to rule with us. We're going to have to run again in order to win on a countywide basis. Judge Pye rules that the countywide um, uh, voting was unconstitutional and that the votes had to be counted on a district basis. District basis. Okay. So I won the 38th district without a runoff mm -hmm. and became the first black to sit in that body uh, in some 92 years. Tell me about that experience, your first day at the state capitol, learning the ropes, what the reaction of your fellow all-white state senators were to you at that time and so forth. In those early years, in 1963 and 64, your first term. 